He is risen. Three small words that brought the collective pace of humanity to an absolute standstill. He is risen. Three words that shattered prisons. Words that shook the earth's foundations. Words that transformed a sense of utter despair into cries of pure joy and ecstasy. Echoes of history's greatest triumph that still shape our reality. Even today, we're assaulted by constant distraction, countless sources waging war for our attention, yet three words pierce the noise. In our hunger for validation, our desperate pleas for love and attention, three words calm our anxieties. In a universe spinning at breakneck speed, its inhabitants locked in an existential crisis, three words proclaim the purpose of our existence. He is risen. Lay hold of this truth and embrace the peace within. Yesterday, fear reigned in our hearts. Yesterday, we sat in crippling darkness. Yesterday, we suffered abuse and all the accusations of a broken world. But today, our King, our Healer, our Defender is risen. And this reality doesn't merely accompany us on a meaningless journey. This changes everything. For you see, if he is risen, then all other pursuits become secondary. All of our failures become insignificant. All criticisms and condemnations become irrelevant. There is only His word, His mission, and His infinite, unconditional love for you. Because He is risen, we look to tomorrow. Tomorrow we will stop defining our worth through status and social media. Tomorrow we will together build an everlasting kingdom. Tomorrow and every day after, we will dance in the radiance of a redeeming Savior who crushed death and set us free. There is nothing that Jesus cannot overcome. We know this because He lives. We know this because He is risen.
of your power, the exceeding greatness 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 of your power.
has rolled the stone away from my heart. Now I receive his saving grace. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Happy Easter and welcome to this experience with the Word of God as we celebrate the risen Christ on this day. What a glorious day this is as we go to the Word and we're reminded of a place of hope and a place of meaning and a place of fulfillment and a place of new beginnings and second chances. Amen. And we are here in Raleigh, the capital city of North Carolina, 101 South Wilmington Street as we are those who are citizens of the kingdom of God, we believe we're a point of contact for the kingdom of God. Simply because we honor the word of God, we serve the risen Christ, and we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we stand on that word in Acts 1-8 that the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon us. And as a result of that, we are witnesses of the risen Christ. Wherever we are in the world and wherever we're located, wherever we are situated, situated, we are witnesses of the risen Christ and he is blessing us and anointing us. And so as a result of that reality out of Acts 1-8, within, we're praying for a double portion of God's anointing and God's spirit. May the Lord anoint this word to encourage your heart today and to lift your spirits and to know that there is hope. And that God is moving in a mighty way. We don't understand it all, but as a hymnist wrote, we'll understand it better by and by. But we are in the hands of our eternal God. Come with me to the word of God. And I invite you to John's gospel, one of my favorites. St. John's narrative and story of the resurrection. All of them are beautiful. Read each one today uh, as you meditate upon the meaning of the resurrection. But come with me to John. And we're coming out of the 20th chapter of John's Gospel. So get your Bible, bring it up, uh, download it, uh, bring it with us as we make our journey through the Word and celebrate what thus saith the Lord. John's Gospel, the 20th chapter and verse 1 reads like this. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw, he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. 
Verse 11, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus's body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she says, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Then, thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you put him. You have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Robani, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them, that he had said these things to her. What, what a marvelous story this really is, as we're reminded of the power of the resurrection and the meaning of this day. We can't worship in a church now, and we are presenting the word in an abnormal, unusual format, and yet we're still gathered together in the spirit of the Lord, bonded by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we may not be in the church physically, but we are members of the church spiritually. So wherever we are, wherever you are, in your car, your home, wherever you are, at your desk, wherever you are listening to this, you're part of the body of Christ. And we are in worship, but we are in worship in a different way. And we know that this too shall pass, but there's meaning in the moment. And something important is taking place in the spiritual realm. And we need to realize that God has a word for us. And that word today is he is risen, that Jesus is alive. And because he's alive, there is hope. And we note in this passage that at Mary on the first day of the week when it was still dark, uh, she made her way to the loved one that she regarded so much in her life and had changed her life in so many ways. And so in the midst of that darkness after the crucifixion, with all of the drama of Good Friday and what it meant. And yet here we find this disciple of Christ, this believer, this servant of God, moving in the midst of the dark, even though it was dark. And we have a lesson in that for us, that even when times are dark in our experiences and when times are dark in the world, when it's nighttime, as it were, that yet still there's work for us to do. And it's amazing as we look around the globe and look all over the country that we have broken through every kind of barrier, reaching people and having a common cause and putting our prejudices and our feelings, our emotions, in some cases our identity aside, our titles in order to serve humankind and human need. And what came to me is it's amazing that we can do that now, which suggests to me we can do that all the time that we really can create that kind of community and we can share the resources as we're sharing now with everybody who's in need. Maybe there's a lesson in that for us to not go back to things as usual, but to do something else. And particularly for people of faith and people who believe in the goodness of the Lord, let's not go back. Let this be a new beginning, a new chapter in our lives and our relationship with Jesus Christ, but also with one another and in the life of the church and what the church really means and the heart of the church, which is the mission that God has given to us to preach the gospel, but also to share the love and to fight against evil in the world. And so here at this dark time and this nighttime, she went before daylight and she went and found that the stone had been rolled away and the precious remains that she was looking for weren't there. And she thought immediately somebody has stole the body of the Lord and someone was up to no good. But that's not what this story is all about. And in the midst of that, uh, that dark time, in the midst of that night season, yet 
the light of resurrection was shining and the reality of a new beginning was emerging and God was moving in a mighty way. But it took her time to understand, as well as all the other disciples, what God was really doing. And so we are reminded that though the night it may be our experience, that we know by faith that daylight will come. It will rise in the morning and there'll be another story to tell. But then we learn to craft our songs of praises in the midnight hour. We, we learn to offer our prayers in the midnight hour. We learn to make ourselves available to what God is doing, even in the midnight hour. And maybe you're feeling that in your own life. Everything has changed and things look bleak in certain ways. And yet in the midst of all of that, there is daylight and it, it's coming. It's here and it's coming. And that is what the resurrection story is all about, the hope that we get in Christ and the fact that Jesus conquered death. And as a result, death has no power. It has no sting because Jesus died, but he rose again. And that's hope for you and it's hope for me. And the second thing we see about this passage, which is so amazing, is all of the running that's taking place. If you know that when she saw what happened and her heart was, was touched by the fact that the remains were not there of her, her savior, her, her rabbi, her teacher. So she runs uh, to Simon Peter because Simon has been designated pretty much as the alpha male of the group. And he's the one that is a leader, became the first pastor of the ancient church and the early church. And so she runs to Peter and uh, all the other disciples and particularly to the disciple described as the one whom Jesus loved. And, and that then um, helps us to understand that was John who wrote the gospel. And so here she runs to Peter and John and she cries out, they've taken my Lord out of the tomb. I don't know where his body is, where his remains are. And so then they, Peter and the other disciple, then start out for the same tomb. And here they are running. Both were running. And, and, and one disciple ran faster than the other one. And you can guess who that was. That was John and that bond, that special intimacy that he had with Christ. And so he was running. He outran Peter and he reached the tomb first. He bent over and he looked in and he saw what was there that goes along with death. But he did not step into that tomb at that time. And perhaps he was thinking about it. Maybe he was mourning. Maybe there was another revelation that he was gaining, whatever. He, he was the first to get there, but not the first to go in. And so then we see that then Peter uh, started for the tomb and he was out run by John. He bent over and he saw what was there. And then Peter came along and went straight into the tomb. And he didn't hesitate, but he went right in to get in the midst of it. And he saw the grave clothing that was there and all that they used in order to cover and minister the bodies at that time. And, and then they realized that Jesus was not there. And in that, in that running, we, we are reminded that we too ought to be running for Jesus. And this is a good time to run to the Lord. If you, it, what are you waiting on? If some people are waiting to have that relationship with Christ and they're, they're waiting for this, that, or the other to come together in their lives. And, and this is a time, my friends, where we need to run to the things of God, run to the Bible, run to the word, run to prayer, the prayer closet, get down on our knees. This is a time to put everything aside until we can hear a voice other than our own and a voice which is a divine voice, which tells us indeed that God is alive, that Jesus lives, that hope lives on. And in the midst of all the midnight experiences, there's a daylight coming. There is a sun shining. God is moving in a mighty way. And that gives us hope, even while we see what is taking place around us in this day and this time. But you know, death is always with us. And there's sorrow that is always with us. There's tragedy always with us. But this has been multiplied in this, in this hour for all the world to then, would then come alive spiritually and begin to go internal, but also to go upward and ask God for help and understanding to go to the Bible and read it carefully, to ask God for interpretation and understanding. And the Lord will speak to us. The Lord has spoken and God will speak again. And so we ought to run to the Lord at this time. And then all the other things in our lives will then be put in place. 
You may have lost your job and perhaps you lost a relationship and perhaps more than any of that, you lost a loved one in the midst of that. And words are not sufficient to bring comfort to you in this hour when you bid farewell to people you love so much because of a virus that attacked their body in such a, an aggressive way. But, but the God we serve is a God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our tribulation. And while no human or medical professional or anyone else perhaps can bring comfort, God can bring comfort and the Lord can be present. God is present in the midst of loss and you can get a job again and you can't replace the people in your lives, no way, but you can take their heritage and then use the good things in their life then to reach for your goals in the rest of the time that you and I have. And we don't know how long that will be, but we know we ought to find ourselves running to the, the Jesus who died for us and rose again the third day, that we ought to get our house in order, that we ought to realize that we're only here for a little while anyway. It won't be long. And when we will cross on over, but our protection is in the blood of the lamb and in that insurance policy that was given by God the Father through the Son and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so there's our hope. That's where our hope lies. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. We dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on, on Jesus' name. We're leaning today on one who conquered death and rose again the third day. And then finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb, he also went in. And we don't know why he took his time, but we recognize that then in this passage, it said, he saw and believed. And perhaps he was recollecting himself, perhaps in the midst of death. Some people take it in different ways and some can't handle it in the moment. And when you have a close, intimate relationship with somebody, you may not act normal when that time comes. And perhaps he was just thinking, maybe he was grieving or maybe he was saying, now understand what he stood for and what he said. He prepared us for this hour, whatever it was. In the passage, it said he believed. What did he believe? Well, he believed that Jesus is the Savior, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He believed that he conquered death. In other words, he prepared us for this. We were not exactly listening, and perhaps we couldn't understand, but he believed. And they still did not understand, the majority of them, how the scripture was being fulfilled in their midst. That Jesus would die, but also he would rise. He's a risen Savior today. Then the disciples went back and where they were staying and they tell the news and then they, they tell the story. And then we see that, that Mary was crying. A natural response to loss and difficulty and pain and sometimes fear, horror and the things that sometimes we are embraced with in our lives as people's lives are shattered in so many ways and and things are in upheaval in so many ways, and, and people do cry. And it's a healthy thing to do, to cry and to weep uh, at the time of loss. And so here she is, she's crying. She stood outside the tomb and cried, and she wept, and she looked into the tomb. And then there were messengers from God there, and the scripture said that there were two angels, and they were dressed in white and and uh, seated where Jesus' body had been, because Jesus was gone now. He wasn't there in that place of death any longer. One was at the head, and the other one was at the foot of where Jesus was lying. Can you imagine that, that scene, the drama of all that? And then they, then, and they ask her, well, then why are you crying? In other words, now it's time to grow her faith. But why are you crying? Didn't you remember what he said, that that he would rise from the dead and this would not be the end of his story. Death is not the end, but is life and life eternal. Don't you remember that's what he said? Why are you crying? And of course, again, she's in the natural. She said, well, they've taken my Lord's body. I don't know where it is. They have stolen it because of the hostility against those disciples and the powers that be in the midst of that empire. They felt like here, it was another scheme to dismantle that fellowship and to do something against Jesus and maybe to take him out or whatever. And she said, and I don't know where they have put him. And then she turned around and lo and behold, the one she loved so much was there. Jesus was standing right there. But she couldn't see him from the natural. She could only see him at this point in the spiritual. And so she didn't recognize him. She thought maybe he was a gardener. And then he also asked her again uh, to grow her faith and said, my sister, uh, do you realize uh, 
that you're crying and weeping as if this is the end of your world, but this is not the end of your world. Uh, there's resurrection morning that is coming. Why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? And uh, and then she goes again. They carried my Lord's body away, and I don't know where they put him. And then Jesus calls her by name, Mary, as if to say, I, I, I am your Savior. You're looking for me, but not in the same realm you were looking for me. And then she she turned to him, and awakening took place in, in, in her life. And as if she wanted to embrace something we're not able to do right now, she wanted to embrace him uh, as if to, to hug him. Uh, but she couldn't do that. He said, do not hold on to me right now uh, because I've not yet ascended. And the, the form that I'm in now, uh, you can't touch me. This is like Shekinah glory. You can't get close to where I am. Instead, go and tell your story. Go and tell my disciples what, have taken, what has taken place because I'm going back to the Father. I'm ascending. And I'm going to your God and my God. And then the church is going to be anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then Mary then went to those disciples. And then she declared something that is so important for us to declare as well. But she says, I have seen the Lord. Have you seen the Lord? Have you run to Jesus? Have you seen the Lord? He died, but he lives. He is alive. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. He lives. He lives in your heart. He lives in your home. He lives in your space. He lives in the world. And she said, I have seen the Lord. And don't you know that was a turning point for her and everybody in that fellowship that now the power, the reality of the resurrection was theirs. And then it became the foundation upon which they proclaimed the gospel. Everybody knew that Jesus was crucified. But now the word is that he has risen. He's alive. And he actually lives inside of us. And we have a story to tell to the nations, to the world, in all of his troubles, that there's a light. Now, daylight has come. And that daylight, even in night, is the risen Christ. And he's here for you, and he's here for me. And what a marvelous way to end this chapter as we look at the purpose of John's gospel. So as we draw to a close, come on down to the 30th and the 31st verse of that. Look at what that says. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. Can you imagine? Even the things that are recorded inspire us in so many ways. And verse 31, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. There's another kind of life, and it's not physical life. It's not about our temples and our bodies. They're, they're, they're going to return to the dust. But this is a spiritual relationship with Christ that comes when we confess that we need the Lord and we cry out to God. We cry, but we cry out to God in prayer and say, Lord, help me, deliver me, come into my life, forgive me of my brokenness and my sin and all the evil I've done in my life. Wash it away. And I want you to walk with me and talk with me and be my savior and be in my life. And as a result of that, we embrace life that cannot and will not die. It's called eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and savior. And that's the message of Easter. That's why we celebrate now. Life is not in a building and in a sanctuary, in a church facility. Life is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you're away from that facility, your life is just the same. It's a life of joy and rejoicing and mercy and love and empowerment. It's a life that Jesus Christ has given unto us. And he said to his disciples, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And even in the storms of life, we can have abundant life because the source is not the world. It's not our imagination. It's not our bodies. But the source comes from God. And so we rejoice with the psalmist as we prepare to pray. <clears throat> Psalm 118, uh, 14 through 24. But the first two verses says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. 
Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. Just raise your hand as you think about the power of the resurrection. God's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live. Claim that as your own and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered my prayer. You have become my salvation. Oh, yes. So we rejoice again. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. And so I say to you, my friends, let us rejoice today and be glad in it. Happy Easter. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. And we thank you for a word of help and a word of hope and a word of encouragement from your word today. We know that death is around us, but we believe in the resurrection, that Jesus died, but he also rose again. And because he rose again for us, we also rise and we can hold our hands up in rejoicing, even in the difficulties of life, and know that God has the final say, that God is life indeed. And even in the midnight challenges, sunlight, daylight is emerging. And let that hope fill our spirits, O oh God, that we might go and tell somebody, don't despair, Jesus lives. Don't give up hope, Jesus lives. Have thine own way. Let your word live inside of us today and let us use it to bless somebody else and may it empower us to be about our Father's business in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray and God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Happy Easter.